Miracy. I always tell people silence is not golden in these cases. You cannot hide and be successful. You just can't. You have to show up and you have to take action. So if they become silent and start hiding, you know, the MIA treatment, then I'm wondering, okay, do they fully understand what's going on here? Are they fully committed to this? Hello, and welcome to Just Between Coaches, the podcast that tackles difficult coaching conversations head on. My name is Melinda Cohen, and I run a business called The Coaches Console. The Coaches Console has supported more than 50,000 entrepreneurs in creating their own profitable coaching businesses. On this show, we explore difficult issues that you might be having with your clients, as well as challenges that you may be facing yourself as a coach. My guest today is one of the original Coaches Console coaches, Denny Carruth. So Denny and I have known each other for a while now, and we're going to talk about how you deal with a client who isn't willing to do the work. As human beings, we tend to resist change for all kinds of reasons. However, clients seek guidance and help from a coach to get results, to change something in their lives or situation. And of course, that is what we love to do, to see our clients get the results they want. But sometimes that isn't as easy as it sounds. Denny Carruth is a behavior change specialist, business coach, and the founder of Master Wellness, which is dedicated to the wellness of leaders. She's also the co-author of two books, Oh, My Health, There is Hope, and Your Time is Now. Welcome, Denny. Hey, Melinda. Oh my gosh, it is so great to have you here. Now, you and I work together at Coach's Console, and we've both had experiences with unwilling clients, as do most coaches. Oh, yeah. And I want to talk about first, before we get into the topic, with your background. Like, I know you come from a musical family, right? Like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, such a fun past. (laughs) I love going there every once in a while. Yeah, I've been singing since I was four years old. I sang my first duet with one of my sisters at my church when I was four years old. And from there, it just kind of escalated to where my creativity had me writing music and I didn't know how to play an instrument, but my oldest sister plays the piano. So I would just sing the song to her. She would write up the music. We started traveling and singing. We cut a 45 in case anybody doesn't know what that is. It's a very small plastic record, but also I have a cousin who was with a very popular group called Champagne and another and nephew actually. Morris Day in the time. My nephew is Morris Day. So we've kind of been in the spotlight for many, many years and just love singing and writing music. And it's just a part of who I am. I love it. And you had an opportunity, I believe, to audition for a certain group, right? (laughs) Like, I want people to know this. Yes, we were actually recording our album. My dad always told us to record an album. And unfortunately, we didn't start that until after he passed away. And we never finished it because the recording studio burned down. That's another story. But when we were in the process of recording our album, we were asked to audition for the Commodores. They were looking for, this is pre-Lionel Richie. That's how long ago it was. And they were looking to change their lead singers and were considering women to like a small group of women. And so there were three, sometimes four of us singing. And we actually declined the audition. but. Yeah, it's in my history. (laughs) Yeah, I just think it's so interesting. Like we know people in certain areas and then there's this whole other depth. And I love that part of your background. Now, when it comes to your coaching, what is your special talent that may not be visible to people directly? Uh, I would say it becomes very notable quickly, but it's insight. It's a gift. It's something that I pray for. I believe I have it. I believe I share it. But it's a lot of the feedback that I get from clients is that they'll say, I love your insight. That was great insight. I cherish your insight. I value your insight. And it's an honor for me to, well, as you know, if you have a talent, use it, right? So anytime I get that feedback, I'm in my zone. I'm like, yes, I'm doing this. This is great. I love it. Now, let's go over the bridge to today's topic. 
So let's say you're a coach with a client who shows signs of unwillingness to do the work. Denny, what is going on with a client who seems to be unwilling? Like what's happening in that? Probably the first thing I question is their understanding of what they truly want and what it takes to get what they want. And then their commitment to that. Because first of all, if they're not really clear, if they don't really understand not only what they want, but what it's really going to take, then they can resist that. They start resisting change. And then the other part of that, like I said, is commitment. If they're not fully committed to what they want and what it takes to get that, they're going to resist it. And so that's something we have to keep revisiting is their commitment. For sure. And how do you get a sense of that unwillingness? What are the signs? What's the red flag or maybe even a yellow flag, like the first sense of what's going on here? I think two things. One is questioning, like they start questioning everything. And the other is silence. (laughs) I always tell people silence is not golden in these cases. You cannot hide and be successful. You just can't. You have to show up and you have to take action. So if they become silent and start hiding, you know, the MIA treatment, then I'm wondering, okay, do they fully understand what's going on here? Are they fully committed to this? And then, like I said, they start questioning. So they always have a reason slash excuse for their questions. You start getting resistance because their questions really aren't make or break things. It's like, why are you asking that? And I'm all about questions. Don't get me wrong. But when they start asking questions that either aren't really relevant or don't make sense, I start going deeper because what is the real resistance that's showing up here? And I actually just had that happen recently with the client. You and I were on a coaching call with our group program and the same thing was happening. You hear your clients questioning things or talking about a certain thing. And, you know, one of the greatest coaching skills is hearing what's not being said. And you're like, wait a minute, they're talking about this, but I think something else is going on. And so for me, it's more of, I get kind of a crinkle in my forehead and I'm like, wait, what's going on? Something else is underlying here. And it's more of just a hunch. And I like to, it's like, I think this might be happening. And then to ask them, is that true? so that they don't go into silence, like you said. And I love that phrase, you can't hide and be successful. Silence is not always golden. Mm -mm. Now, how does that become difficult for the client when they get in this kind of spot? Difficult for the client? I would say that usually what I see show up when it's difficult for them is that they've not been called out before. So they haven't been questioned on the why of what's going on. But also, even deeper than that, maybe they've not been challenged enough to make the change, to take that step, to ignore the little voices in their head and not fall back into past patterns. And I've had that where clients have said, I always do this. I always get to this point and then, or I always do this one thing and then. And then I'm like, okay, so why are you doing that now? There's always an underlying factor. A lot of times it's almost like an undercurrent. You don't see it, but if you get caught up in it, you'll get sucked under. Right, which goes back to what you were saying earlier, to make sure when you're working with that client that they're clear, like understanding what they really want and their commitment to that. How do you help your clients get that clarity? It's all about the why, right? So the why is the big thing, really getting an understanding of what you want, why you want it, how important it is to you, and are you committed? Well, okay, understanding that action has to be made, right? And then are you committed to all those things? Are you committed to what you want? Are you committed to why you want it? Are you committed to the action that it's going to take to achieve that? Because if they're not committed to all those things, there's a missing piece. So we've got to find out what's missing and can they commit to that once they discover what it is? I know you have a really cool process, only because I've been working with you for all these years now. You've got a really cool process to help people understand the impact of their why or their commitment so that they really see how it impacts other areas, all areas of their life. Can you talk more about that? You're talking about my align process? 
even though I saw the pattern, it took me a long time to actually call it out. And I named it several years ago, but even after that, I hadn't really said, this is my signature system. So even while I was taking clients through it, assessing who they are, what their core values are, what their action words are, just really understanding what their identity is. So there's that assessment. So A is for assess. Assess and acknowledge because it's one thing to get it, but it's another thing to claim it. You know what I mean? So that's that part. And then the L is for leaning in. Can we lean into those things? How do we get those things to work for us in our life? How are we stepping forward in these life situations as who we are, that identity? Then comes the I, ignite inspired action or ignite inspiration. Because unless we can get that fire burning, keep the fire smoldering, it's going to fizzle out. We're going to fizzle out. And action has to be taken. And if our action does not come from inspiration, we can lose our motivation very, very quickly, which goes back to that why, right? Then there's G, which I love. And you'll love this part, Melinda. G is about giving, giving to yourself first. So that's your self-care, honoring and acknowledging who you are and taking care of that. And then um, giving of yourself, like your time, your energy, that kind of thing but then giving from yourself. So that goes back to your identity. Because if I can't give from myself in my relationships, if I can't give to myself for my physical health, then that's an issue. (laughs) That's a problem. Then we're struggling with that identity crisis is what I call. And then uh, last but not least is the end. This is where the boundaries come in. And we're acknowledging and setting those boundaries along the way in this aligned process so that by the time they get to the end of this six-month journey, they know and have set the boundaries. What's this going to take for their physical health, for their spiritual level, for their relationship, for their business, for their environment? What boundaries need to be honored to protect and to support who we are and how we show up and how we do life the best? I love it. I love that process. And what I've witnessed is when you interact with your clients in that way, it helps them to step into the uncertainty or step out of their comfort zone where they might be resisting or they might not be willing to do the work. So let's say that the client doesn't progress and is not willing to do the work towards the goal. How do you approach that type of situation? Like I know you talk about the align process. Let's say you've done that and they're still showing up with that resistance. How do you handle that? If they have really done the work of the A, of assessing and acknowledging, I'm going to take them back to that constantly. I'm going to take them back to how are you showing up? Who are you showing up as? Who are you in this situation? How can you be that in this situation? Because it doesn't do any good to discover all those things and then not live it, not walk that out. So I'm going to call them out on that in a loving way, of course, (laughs) but that becomes the challenge is can they show up and do the work, do what it takes as who they are? Because while it takes them out of their comfort zone, it's not taking them to a place they've never been unless they have been living alive all their lives. I mean, seriously, and that can happen. Don't get me wrong. You know, people are not rediscovering who they are. They're discovering for the first time who they are. So if I can get them back to thinking about that, and then what would that look like if you were to show up as that person in this situation to take that action? I love that right there, that coaching tip right there. I just want to pull that out. So when we have those folks that bump into the resistance and we just see they're not willing to move forward, kind of pause, taking them back to the A, right? And then that question, if you were to show up as that How would you be in this moment, Yes, in this situation, so that they can embrace a different persona to take different action? Exactly. I've actually had people, when we're discovering or rediscovering their identity, say, this isn't like me. I don't really resonate with that. And I'll go, that's interesting. Do you believe that that means that's not who you are? Or does that mean that you've just never stepped into that? Now, talk more about identity, because I know you're big on that. And so 
how does that help them become more willing to do the work? Keep expanding on that. Well, I believe that we were created with these God-given talents. And that means the only thing we can do is discover them. Nobody can give them to us. You know, we can't learn them. They're talents. They're in our DNA. So once we discover it, it becomes a matter of living that out and actually stepping into that. Once we discover it, then it's putting the identity to the situation. For instance, my top five talents, my number one is strategic. And you've probably never noticed that I'm a (laughs) a very strategic thinker. And there's a process that goes on in my brain with everything. So for me, for me to acknowledge that I'm strategic, I can call on that when I get stuck. I can call on that when I'm working with a client. Who can I be as strategic to help this situation? Once we learn pieces of their identity, it's about putting it all together because that's who they are. Yeah. Now, one of your methods uses a bridge analogy. And I know that you and I have taken many pictures on bridges, a lot of selfies in our retreats and events that we've done together over the years. So can you elaborate on how you use that? Yes. (laughs) I love bridges. Always the first thing that comes out of my mouth. I love bridges. I see them in so many different ways. I like to look at it like it's a place to pause and rest. It's a place to reflect because you can look back and see exactly where you are or where you've come from and know that you've not strayed from the path. That bridge keeps you on the path, even though you have an opportunity to reflect and be grateful for how far you've come. Even if there's a why in the road at the end of that bridge, I can take the time right now to pause and really get clear on where I want to go next. And that bridge is going to take me there. So a bridge could be a person, a place, or a thing. I like to think of myself as a bridge sometime for people. You know, keep them on path, give them a different perspective, opportunity to reflect, look ahead at possibilities. But it could also be a place or a thing. And just honoring the bridge for what it's capable of doing in our lives to create change is just amazing for me. It's usually a part of what I take people through when we have an enrollment conversation. Because then they, you know, they have an opportunity to see I could be that bridge. This time and space that we have together could be the bridge. This next challenge or thing that they're going through could be the bridge. So their bridge to breakthrough strategy session is that. I take them to the bridge to where we walk through this process of visualization. I have them close their eyes. They can turn their camera off. And I walk them through a very detailed process of that overview. And we get very clear on what's on the other side of that bridge. And I love it that in the coaching relationship, at any point, you know, it might be a a couple weeks or a couple months down the road, you can bring that bridge analogy back to help them locate themselves and work through their unwillingness or work through their resistance in whatever pace or direction makes sense, as long as they're aware of it and conscious. I love that approach. Now, we've talked about that, the align process, the onboarding, helping them with their mindset, using this bridge analogy. So with all of that, have you ever had a client that just flat out said, well, I don't think I want to do the work? Like, do you end the coaching relationship? Do you dig deeper into what your client really wants? How do you handle that kind of situation? Kind of all of the above. In all my years of doing personal training, group training, coaching, I've only, quote unquote, fired two clients. And the first I was training, he and his wife, and he was one of these people that would show up to his session and just, I could just tell he was not there. You know what I'm saying? Very distracted, very not involved. He would go through the motions, not very responsive. And I had to really ask him, like, why are you here? Why do you take out this time three times a week to show up at my door and not really put a lot into it? And it just came down to that's the way he was. And that response did not jive with me at all. And it was painful to work with him. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I just, yeah, I didn't look forward to it. And I just let him know that I didn't believe 
that he was committed to the work, going back to that I said earlier, for what it was going to take to get the goals that he said he wanted. And if he was sticking to, he wanted those goals and he was committed to the goal, he wasn't committed to the action. And so that, that just didn't work. And so I, you know, I let him go. But even more recently, I worked with someone and we were doing online training and nutrition coaching. And I worked with her for a whole year. And at one point toward the end, it's like every session we would have the aha moments. We would have the clarity, the next steps. I'm committed to it. Let's go. Rah, rah, rah. And then in between sessions, fall off the bandwagon, disappear, not respond or question things. And so toward the end, she asked me, she admitted, I was just doing old patterns. And I had called her out several times. You know, you're falling back into what you told me you didn't want anymore. When did that not become important to you again? Just questions, alternative things to do, helping her create her own decisions and choices, giving possibility, all the things, you know, all the things. But I stuck with her. And I stuck with her because I believed in her. And you know, Melinda, we can believe in them more than they believe in themselves. I do believe that. Yeah. But we can't want it more than they do because that just becomes a big stress thing. So I did believe in her more than she believed in herself. And so I stuck with it. But toward the end, she asked me why I didn't fire her because she knew she hadn't done the work. And so there's a part of me that says, I wish I had (laughs) fired her. (laughs) <laughs> did you tell her that? I did. Yeah. But I also let her know that the reason why I didn't was because I believed in her. And I had that hope from session to session to month to month to a full year that at some point she would see that she was worth what she wanted. She was worth the action that it would take to get there. But in the end, until she was committed to both of those things, She could go to another coach, another trainer, another class, another program, but until she commits to not only the goal, but the action that it takes to get there, she will be where she is. Yeah, I know for me, well, now I don't even do private coaching anymore because I work inside our group programs and I've got my amazing team of coaches like you. And when I was doing coaching, I remember that I would always have this kind of filter Because I would only work with a certain number of clients, right? Back in the day when I had a full practice, it was usually 22, 25 private clients that I would have. And if I did have somebody that wasn't doing the work and I'm like, okay, hold on a second. And like you said, you ask the questions as a coach, we kind of push those edges and find those boundaries. And it finally came down to me thinking, well, if I keep working with you, there's somebody else that is committed to transformation that I'm not serving. And so am I okay with that? And it's a fine dance. It's never a black and white, like if it's this, then it's that answer. Or if it's that, then it's this answer. And it was just, a, I had to ask the question for each situation to see, was I okay with that or not? And then have that conscious conversation with the client for them to either step up or step away. Yes. And it really is a very individualized thing. But this is what I also love about the identity piece that I use, Melinda, is that when I know the type of person they are, and it's not a personality thing, again, it gets back to talents and gifts and values that we've discovered in them. Once I know those things, I can go back to that. I know how, like, for instance, if they're a learner, I have two clients right now that they're learners. And so I have to make the coaching experience a learning experience for them. They get it if I make it a learning experience because they're learners. But at the same time, I have to put a cap on that so that they don't, as we say, turn the volume up too loud of being a learner and they're just learning and they're not doing anything. So then it's like, okay, what other talents and gifts do you have? What other values do you have that you can step into? to make this process work for you. I know the process works. I know it does. I know it'll work for you. Are you willing to do the work for it? So now that I have that, I can go back to that. And I wish I had used it many years earlier, but I've been using that now for probably close to eight to 10 years, maybe. Um, 
But that helps me with that resilient client. And you've probably heard me say before, I love just kind of putting it out there and saying it with authority. Be the chooser. Mm, Be the chooser. We Mm -hmm. have a gift of choice. So when it comes to changing your behaviors so that you can achieve the life or business that you want, so that you can have the relationships and the physical health that you want, look for the opportunities. What's possible within those opportunities? And then you get to choose. So every day you get to choose. Do you stay in bed and hit the snooze button five times or do you choose to get up? In your business, you get to choose. Do I do the work? Do I make those calls? Do I show up for my client or do I do something else less than? And going back to your bridge analogy, I think back to some of my clients. And while I didn't use that bridge analogy, when they weren't showing up, they weren't doing the work, they were kind of hesitant. I could tell they weren't engaged. When I would coach them around that, what we discovered is they weren't ready to move forward. They thought they were. And once they started heading down that path, it legitimately became, I'm not ready for this. And that was okay. But they got that clarity and then we could pause. So it doesn't always mean you have to fire a client. It might just be that your clarity has gotten to the point where they pause because they're not ready to move forward. They've already done enough work. And it's like, ooh, I I just need to sit here for just a little while. And so we stopped coaching. And then there were even other times when the clarity helped them realize, wow, I thought I had goals X, Y, and Z that I wanted you to help me with, but now I actually don't want that. I want ABC instead, which meant I wasn't their coach anymore. That It wasn't the right relation. They needed some other type of support. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't always mean resistance and clients being unwilling doesn't always have to be a bad thing. That's one of the things I want to land inside this conversation is that your coaching, your support, your holding that space for them may help them realize and discover things that then they take different actions or choose a different path. And that can be okay. And we have to be okay. That's why we can't get attached to a certain outcome for our clients. We just have to hold the space for our clients. That's exactly right. I've actually had probably two, maybe three clients that I've passed on to another coach, either as a break in their coaching process, you know, here you go do this program for six weeks with them and then come back and we'll pick up where we left off. Or you're at a place now where I'm going to pass the baton and I feel like you and this coach could work better. So you're absolutely right. It's not always a negative thing, but I always look for that resistance first. I look at identity also, and then I look at, you know, and not necessarily in this order, but I am looking at the commitment of the goal, which may change, and the commitment of the action, which may change. Because sometimes once people get into the process, as you know, they get going and they go, this isn't what I wanted. I didn't sign up for all this stuff, or I didn't think this was going to be that. And it's getting them to that clarity can change their life. Yes. So let's summarize a few things that we've talked about today. So first of all, we talked about having the understanding of what they want and the commitment to those results. Like that clarity is going to help combat the resistance that might come down the road. And then Denny shared this amazing process, the align process of going through certain steps to help them deepen that clarity that continues to equip them and arm them to handle resistance or willingness as it comes up. And then I love how you talked about, you know, as coaches, it's our job to call them out. It's our job to challenge them. And that's where the real fun begins, I think. And then I love how you talked about in the enrollment conversation, you bring in that analogy. For you, it's the bridge. For others listening, and it might be something else. But what's that analogy that they can imagine and visualize that sets them up for the journey ahead. And then, of course, like we were just talking about, resistance and clients being unwilling doesn't always mean a negative thing. So pay attention to that as well. Denny, do you have any parting words? Oh my gosh. Um, Two things for the coach and the client. One is be the chooser. Absolutely. Always look at choice and spend some time, spend some quiet time 
looking at what your choices really are, because we know that even not choosing is a choice. So, but I always tell coaches, so many of the people that I coach through Coaches Console, I'm constantly telling them, be your best client. In other words, look at what you want your client to be, how you want them to show up, the things you want them to do when they work for you. Don't let it be any more than you ask of yourself. So you be your best client and always be the chooser and always be the chooser from a place of clarity and positive perspective. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of Just Between Coaches. And also a big thank you to Denny Carruth for this fascinating and amazing conversation. You can find out more about her at www.dennycarruth.com. That's Denny, D-E-N-I, Carruth, C-A-R-R-U-T-H.com. Denny, thank you so much for coming to the show. Oh, thank you. This was amazing. I love always working with you, Melinda. I'm Melinda Cohen, and you've been listening to Just Between Coaches. Just Between Coaches is part of the Mercy FM podcast network, which also includes Course Lab, Making It, and Once Upon a Business. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Mishi Lance scripted and assembled the episode, and Danny Eney is our executive producer. If you don't want to miss future episodes, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you liked the show, please leave us a starred review. It's the best way to help us get these ideas to more people. And if you have a question for Just Between Coaches, put the show title in the subject line and send it to podcasts at miracy.com. That's podcasts, plural, at miracy, M-I-R-A-S-E-E.com. 